Hi, my name is Will Cusey, and I'm a member of the Small Business Ombudsman team here at the US Consumer Product Safety Commission. Today, I'm going to be demystifying product safety and compliance, and I'm gonna give you best practices and tips for how to make safe, compliant consumer products. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you're watching live, please submit your questions through the GoToWebinar system, and we'll answer them following the presentation. We're not going to be answering questions during the webinar, but we wanna get your questions. We want you to feel free to ask them. This presentation is the start of a conversation about this topic, and we wanna get your questions and feedback if you have them. Also, it's important to note that everyone who registered will receive a follow-up email with a recording of the presentation and a PDF handout of the slides. The PDF will also have clickable links. So as we're going through the presentation, you'll see lots of links. Those links will be clickable from the PDF document. They are not clickable from the video screen itself. You'll need to see them from the PDF. And you can also download, if you're watching live, the PDF from the handouts tab within the GoToWebinar program. If you're watching a recording of this presentation, please send your questions to sbo at cpsc.gov. You can also request a copy of these slides or any other slides from any of our recorded presentations. All you have to do is again, send an email to sbo at cpsc.gov with the date, the link, or the title of the presentation and we'll be happy to send those out to you. So what are we doing here today? Why did you join up this with this presentation? What we hear oftentimes from small business owners, they're just starting out. They want to make a safe product. They want to do the right thing. They don't know where to start. They don't know what questions to ask. They don't know what they don't know. That can be a difficult position to be in. So we wanna to try to remove the unknown and at the very least, help you, the small business owner, understand at the very least what you don't know. And hopefully more than that, hopefully we can actually give you the answers that you need to make safe and compliant products. But the purpose of this presentation is designed to give you the knowledge of the questions that you want to ask and that you need to ask upfront when you're trying to make or design a product in order to make sure that it's safe and compliant. So what are those questions? What are those topics of discussion that we're going to go over and that you would want to be asking yourself during this process. The first question is, what type of business am I? Might sound like an obvious question, but it's actually not necessarily the most obvious answer. So I'm going to go over some of the definitions from our primary statute, the Consumer Product Safety Act, and try to help you understand where you would be categorized, what type of business you would be falling into. So once we do that, we need to figure out what type of product you're making. Is it a children's product? Is it a, is it a general use product? Is it a children's toy? What type of product is it? You can't really move forward to understanding what requirements are in place until you understand how it's categorized at its base level. Question number three, how do I identify the labeling, testing, and certification requirements for my product? Most of CPSU's requirements fall broadly into the labeling, testing, and certification categories. How do you figure that out? What steps can you take to understand what those requirements are for your product? And continuing on here, what's the difference between compliance, proving compliance, and safety? Why do those concepts matter? Why should we think about those? Well, I'm happy to go over those. And the last topic here, and this is really the goal. 
I think this should be the goal for everyone making a consumer product. How do I make the safest possible product? Okay, you're just starting out. What type of business are you? Manufacturer, importer, private labeler, distributor, retailer, freight forwarder, something else? How are these terms defined? How do I figure out where I fit in? When the CPSC writes or says a manufacturer must do X to comply, what type of business is CPSC referring to? It's not necessarily the immediately obvious answer. The CPSA, the Consumer Product Safety Act, this is our main statute, our main law, if you will, that governs the majority of CPSC's activities. Manufacturers defined to include both manufacturers and importers. So phrased a little bit differently, what we're really saying is domestic manufacturers, individuals manufacturing domestically or importers for products that are manufactured internationally. So when we are writing out guidance on our website, we say the manufacturer must do X, Y, or Z. We are including importers in that discussion. Importers are legally considered the manufacturer if that is the applicable scenario. We're also including private labelers here. And if you look at section 14 of the Consumer Product Safety Act, section 14 includes private labelers as entities that are required to approve and certify compliance of their consumer product in a GCC or a CPC. And we'll talk about that a little more later. So we have our first kind of initial grouping. When we're talking about manufacturers doing X, Y, or Z, we're really talking about manufacturers, importers, and most of the time, private labelers. What about distributors and retailers? And distributors and retailers are selling the products. Distributors are not selling them to end consumers. They're selling them from maybe importers to retailers and they're the in-between entity and retailers send selling generally speaking to the end consumer who's using the product are they responsible for proving and certifying compliance they are not they are not but they are entitled to receive compliance related information a cpc or a gcc from the manufacturer the importer or the private labeler so they're part of this process they're selling the products they own the products until they are sold again. But they're not the ones ultimately responsible in most scenarios. It is the manufacturer, the importer, or the private labeler, but they are part of the process. What about third party logistic, logistics providers or contract carriers, freight forwarders? These entities are not manufacturers, distributors, retailers, importers, or private labelers. They are receiving or transporting consumer products from one point to another. They're not part of this process, except in the sense that they are shipping and forwarding these products from one location to another. So you have three broad categories. You have the manufacturers, the importers, and the private labelers. Those are the entities primarily responsible for certifying and proving compliance. You have distributors and retailers who are selling those products and you have logistics providers, freight forwarders, carriers that are shipping and carrying products from one destination to another. These are the three broad categories of business types. These definitions can be found at 15 USC 2052. If you want to look up more information about the section 14 reference about certificates, that's 15 USC 2063. And those are available if you put those into an internet search, they'll come right up for you. So moving, moving along, now that we've talked a little bit about what type of business someone might be and how they might be categorized. And depending on that categorization, what their obligations are. And we're really primarily focusing on the manufacturers, the importers and the private labelers during this presentation. Just so we're clear. So when we're talking about you, Y-O-U, 
the U that we're going to be talking about going forward, the U are manufacturers, importers, and private labelers. So once you've figured out, let's say you've figured out, okay, I'm, I'm an importer. I have to do these requirements. I need to make a safe and compliant product. How do I categorize my product? How do I even start thinking about it? And yes, one product can fit into multiple different defined product categories. That is something that often happens. The first place you wanna start is to identify whether it is a children's product or a general use product. That is the biggest decision point that you will have for categorization. And it makes the biggest impact on what types of requirements are in place. You can, there's a very nice webpage we put together, cpsc.gov forward slash children's product that has this information. It's a lot of helpful guidance to help you understand how to make this determination. Now, while you are the entity ultimately responsible for making this determination, we're happy to help you do that. This is why we're here. This is why the Small Business Ombudsman team exists. Send us an email to sbo at cpsc.gov with any questions you have. This is meant to be the start of a conversation. We wanna to continue to have that conversation with you following this presentation. So the best way to think about how to make the distinction between children's and general use products is to look at the definition for children's product. And this is reprinted from our statute, from that definitional statute citation that I just gave you. And children's product means a consumer product designed or intended primarily, that's the key word, primarily for children 12 years of age or younger. It doesn't mean a consumer product designed or intended for use by any child 12 years of age or younger. It means it's primarily intended for that audience. It would be something that has greater appeal to children under the ages of 12 and less appeal, diminishing appeal, to individuals over the age of 12, 13 and older, if you will. So there are a few criteria that can help you make this decision. It's right in the definition, and the criteria are quite helpful in helping you think about how to categorize. In the web page, the guidance page we link to goes in, into even further depth here. The first thing to think about is the statement of intent for how the product should be used by the manufacturer, the importer, the private labeler of the product. And that such statement is reasonable. You're not going to say a pacifier is a general use product for, for individuals 13 years or older. Right? That's not a reasonable statement. The next thing to think about is whether the product is represented in its advertising, promotion, and display as being appropriate for use by children 12 years of age or younger? Is it shown to be suitable for children 12 and under? But all that being said, there could be reasonable intent from the manufacturer. There could be consistent marketing images and language. But how is the product commonly recognized? Point C. How is the product commonly recognized by consumers? If a manufacturer intends the product to be used in one way for a certain audience, and all of the marketing is consistent with that intent, but consumers are using it in a different way, view the product as being suitable for use in a different way, then that can change the determination. So it's really important after you start selling a product to try to keep up to speed as much as you can with comments and feedback from your consumers as to how they're using the product. You might have spent a lot of time thinking about an age grade and an appropriate classification, and then it could turn out to be incorrect based just solely upon point C, about how it's commonly recognized for use. How is it actually being used is very important. And the last point here is our age determination guidelines. We recently updated this last year. There is a link here. When you get the PDF version, you can click this link and it'll bring you right to this document. This is an extremely help, helpful document that goes over 
the use characteristics for different ages for how those different age children in small increments, granted as well, for how those differently aged children would use and interact with a product. This can very much help you determine and figure out what an appropriate age grade is for your product. This is why we put this out. It's to help you understand how to effectively and accurately age grade your product. So if you're just starting out, if you have no idea what the appropriate age range is for a toy or a product, I recommend that you check out this guide, spend some time combing through it and see if that can help you figure this out. We're also happy to help, right? We're also happy to help. We're always here to help. You're the one that has to make the final decision, but we can help inform your decision. Absolutely. You're, don't think that you're on your own trying to make these decisions. We're here to help you make those decisions, even though you're the ones ultimately making them. So what are some other types of categorizations? What are other things that maybe I should be thinking about that I would say it's really important if you're making a children's product to figure out, is it a toy or not a toy? Is it just a children's product or is it also a toy? Toys are generally products primarily for play value, that have play value for playing or make-believe situations of play. Here's a good example. A children's product that's not a toy would be just a baby blanket, a swaddle blanket. Maybe there's some ancillary play value there, but the, pro the product is primarily intended not for play scenarios, for laying on, for warmth, for comfort. Baby blanket would not be considered a toy in the overwhelmingly vast majority of situations. On the other hand, you have a stuffed teddy bear. That stuffed teddy bear absolutely would be intended for use during play as a play thing. And so that would be categorized as a children's toy as well as a children's product. And the reason why I'm mentioning these categorization uh, things at all is because depending on how it's categorized, the requirements change. And children's toys have to meet additional requirements beyond what children's products have to meet. So a children's toy that is also a children's product has additional requirements than a product that is just a children's product, like a blanket. There are also other ways to categorize the product that can add additional requirements or additional concerns. Durable infant or toddler products is a specific class of product. It's, it's specifically defined. There's about 20 of these types of products. Everything from cribs and bassinets to sling carriers, to gates and enclosures, there's a narrowly defined list. We can help you figure out whether your product is in fact a durable infant or toddler product or not. And if it is, it comes with additional requirements, additional performance standards typically. Maybe you're making a childcare article that's also a children's product. Childcare article is a product primarily intended for use by children under three that facilitates sleeping, eating, feeding, or teething. And Plasticized components of childcare articles would have to undergo phthalates testing. That's important to understand that. And there are, of course, lots of other categorizations, art materials, hazardous substances, depending on the categorization that can influence the requirements that exist for your product. So once we've identified the kind of business we are, how it's categorized, or maybe we have a general sense of how it's categorized, but not maybe very specifically. Maybe we understand that we are an importer of children's products, but we're not sure what else we are. What else can we do to figure these things out? The Regulatory Robot is a program that we created. It is a tool that will ask you a series of questions. And at the end, it will give you some customized guidance for the likely applicable requirements in place for your consumer product. This tool can help you narrow down your focus quite a bit, quite considerably. It can help you identify additional categorization. It can help you identify the labeling, the testing, the certification requirements in place for your product. It is a great place to start if you're not sure where to start.
if you don't know what you don't know, which is often where people are starting, start at the robot, and that will greatly assist you in, in figuring these things out. So the robot is laid out in kind of three sections, labeling requirements, testing requirements, and then certification. And labeling requirements, it's important, the takeaway for this slide is that it's important to know that labeling requirements could exist and that there are quite a few different types of labeling requirements depending on how the product is categorized. The robot will identify those for you, but you can also figure these things out for yourself. We recently published a new page. This link will be clickable from the PDF document. We recently published a new page with some of the most commonly asked questions about labeling requirements. Number one being tracking labels, most commonly asked about question. If you have questions about any of these requirements, this, this presentation isn't really going into depth about what the requirements are. And if you have questions about what those requirements are, we are happy to answer them at sbo at cpsc.gov. Please feel free to send us an email, or if you're watching live, you can send us a question through the system. So the takeaway here, again, it's important to know that labeling requirements could exist. And that when you're thinking about how to comply, how to make a safe product, that is an item that needs to be considered. Testing, okay? Maybe you figured out, you've done the robot, you've identified testing requirements for your stuffed teddy bear, you understand that it's a toy, that it's a children's product, that you're the importer, that you're the one responsible for certifying compliance, for ensuring a safe product. What now? What do you do now? A couple of things you can do. Go to cpsc.gov forward slash certify, cpsc.gov slash certify. Lots of helpful information on that page about all of the various testing requirements and what you can do to educate yourself on these testing requirements. Common question we also get is where do I find a lab to do the testing? Where, where can I go? What are my obligations in that regard? If you're making a children's product, in the vast majority of situations, you have, that testing has to be conducted at a CPSC accepted laboratory. We have a comprehensive list available at cpsc.gov slash lab search. And that's a clickable link, will be a clickable link. And all of the CPSC accepted laboratories from all around the world are in here. And you can filter your search by testing scope, by country, all kinds of things to get a narrowly tailored list specifically for you and your needs. For general use products, you could actually use, in a lot of scenarios, you could actually use the lab search page to find a CPSC accepted laboratory to do that testing for you. And there are crossover requirements like for mattresses or for rugs where you can find a lab that can do that testing and it's, and it's documented. There are other situations such as for lighters, other requirements that are never considered children's products where you wouldn't be able to use the lab search page to identify a specific laboratory, but you could still use it and reach out to labs and just ask if they do this testing. Could they do this testing for cigarette lighters, for example? But you don't need to use a CPSC accepted laboratory if you're making a general use product. You could do this testing in-house. There are some testing standards that are not overly complex that don't require a lot of sophisticated equipment that could be done in-house as long as it's done correctly and documented well. You could also use an external facility that's not CPSC accepted. Maybe you have a relationship with the local university and they have a small testing lab and they have some capabilities to do some testing. That's also possible too, as long as they can fulfill the obligations of the standard. So general use products, a little more flexibility on how and where these products are tested. Children's products almost always have to be at a CPSC accepted facility, but general use products, there's some more flexibility. We also recommend for general use products to think about a reasonable testing program, not necessarily mandatory, but it's, it's something you can put in place to try to remove some of the 
day-to-day -day thought process and just have a plan in place and a process in place to carry out your testing and compliance duties to ensure a safe product. What about certification? So labeling, we got testing. What about certification? So for children's products, all children's products need, and all manufacturers of children's products need to produce a children's product certificate. But important point here, not all requirements for children's products need to be certified in a children's product certificate. There is a specific list. This list is on our website. You can find it by going to cpsc.gov forward slash CPC or going to cpsc.gov forward slash certify. Those links will help you get to this page. Specific lists of which requirements need to end up in a CPC, which need to be certified and third-party tested. There are some requirements that do not need third-party testing and certification chief among them would be labeling requirements specifically a tracking label requirement tracking label requirements do not need to be tested or certified at a third-party laboratory they do not need to appear in your children's product certificate so it's important to understand which requirements need to be in your cpc and which requirements don't need to be in your cpc this is important that it's done correctly and we have the tools available on our website already to help you understand how to do this. So that's the other part of this presentation that I think that's important to mention. As a lot of this information is out there, a lot of this information we have already produced for you, you might just have trouble figuring out where to go, where to find this information, how to find it to give yourself the knowledge. So part of this presentation is, is we're trying to organize some of these resources in a way and present them to you where it's more intuitive to find and identify the key areas to look at. And so that's, that's partly what we're trying to do here. For general use products, let me be clear, only general use products subject to again the specific list that we've published on our website is longer than this this is just a screenshot only general use products subject to a specific list of requirements that we've identified have to be certified in a gcc if it's not on that list it doesn't need a gcc i cannot say that any planer not every general use product needs a gcc not every general use product with mandatory requirements under CPSC's jurisdiction needs a CPS GCC either. So it could be a situation where you're importing ceiling fans. Ceiling fans do not have mandatory standards. They do not have any specific mandatory standards with the CPSC other than reporting requirements. So those products would not need a GCC because there are no, there's no applicable standard. Additionally, something like general use art supplies, maybe some paints or some paint brushes, things that might be subject to the art materials requirements under the FHSA. Those would also not have to be certified. They're not on this list. You can see, well, this is only part of it, but it's not on this list. If you go and look at it, art materials do not appear. Mandatory standard, mandatory requirements for art materials are in place, but they do not need to be certified in a GCC. So, when you're going through the robot and you're, and you're making a general use product, everyone gets the general certificate of conformity section, but the, one of the very first links is to check this list to see if your product is on it. If it's not on it, you don't need it. If it is on it, you do need it. It's that simple for general use products. Okay, so we've thought about what type of business we are, how to categorize our product, how to find and identify the requirements to understand that requirements are generally grouped into three main categories, labeling, testing, and certification, and that we can check to see if there are any labeling, testing, or certification requirements in place for our product by using the robot and other sources on cpsc.gov. So now, we're gonna spend some time talking about the differences between compliance, proving compliance, 
and safety and how those different concepts intersect with each other, the differences between those and why it's important for you, the manufacturer, the importer, or the private labeler to understand the differences between those concepts. People get messed up sometimes on those and we wanna to try to give you that knowledge so you can make informed decisions so you can avoid unnecessary testing that does not any add any safety value, but still ensure that you have a high degree of assurance of compliance and safety for your product. So sometimes some requirements mandate third-party testing to prove compliance, but not all. Sometimes a product only has to comply with the, require, with the requirements, but not prove compliance. And sometimes something could be fully compliant, but still have safety defects where the CPSC has to take action, corrective action, or conduct a recall. So it's important to think about your product, not just from the sense of complying or proving compliance, but also the idea of making a safe product, trying to make a safe product. Okay, so what do we mean? Compliance is just the idea of meeting an applicable CPSC requirement Whereas proving compliance is demonstrating through testing or other means that the product or component part of the product meets the applicable CPSC requirement. So let's go over a couple of examples to help illustrate this because these are kind of abstract terms. And especially if you're new to safety and compliance and this whole topic in general, your, your, your eyes might start to glaze over a little bit. So let's try to unglaze the eyes a bit and focus them in on a couple of examples that are very relatable. So the CPSC has requirements for sharp points and sharp edges for children's products intended for use by children under eight years of age. Those are found at 16 CFR 1500.48 and 1500.49. These are requirements that mandatory compliance for applicable products but they are not requirements that mandate proof or testing to prove compliance. So let's think about it this way. If you have that baby blanket again, simple, plain baby blanket, not a toy, just a regular children's product, very simple, just a piece of fabric, essentially. Does that baby blanket have any sharp points or sharp edges? No, it does not. And it is very obvious that it does not. So sending it to be tested for sharp points and sharp edges would not add any safety value here. It would not tell you anything that you didn't already know. You would already know that you comply with the sharp points and sharp edges requirements because your baby blanket does not have any sharp points or sharp edges, not even close. Another good example is labeling, tracking labels. Again, tracking labels, not something that you have to prove compliance with. You don't have to get a laboratory to prove that your tracking label is compliant. That is not a requirement here, not at all. Tracking labels are something that can be visually determined to be compliant. You don't need a laboratory to visually tell you that something is compliant. If you can look at the requirement, look at your label and figure out yourself that it's compliant. But what about Okay, so what about in scenarios when you're fully compliant and you're proving compliance with all the requirements you have to prove compliance? Let's say you're making a baby onesie, three month old baby onesie. It's got a screen printed image on the front. It's got painted snaps. What are the requirements here? Right off the top of my head, I can tell you clothing flammability potentially depending on what type of fabric it's made of. The snaps will have to be tested for lead. The paint on the snaps will have to be tested for a different lead requirement. And the screen printed image, depending on how it's used and whether it's creating a surface coating or absorbing into the textile surface, you might need additional lead and paint testing there as well. But what you would not need is you would not need to test the snaps and the product as a whole for small parts hazards. The small parts regulation exempts clothing in 16 CFR 1501.3 from testing for small parts. But that doesn't mean it's still not a concern. And the CPSC 
has taken action previously. There are documented recalls where the CPSC has recalled onesies where the staffs have become liberated. This is moving beyond just their regulatory requirements, statutory requirements, and thinking about the safety of the product as a whole. So this could be a situation where if you had your baby onesie and you did the lead testing and the flammability testing, you have your tracking label, you produce your CPC, you're fully compliant with CPSC's requirements. There's no issue from a compliance standpoint. But you might wanna be in a situation where you're doing a little bit of extra testing to make sure those snaps are securely fastened and that they're not becoming liberated and they're not becoming small choking hazards. And so the big takeaway here is that there are situations when there are compliance requirements where you don't need to waste money on doing additional testing. And then on the other hand, there are situations when there are not any compliance requirements in place, but you might wanna think about doing some testing anyways. And I think the 1C SNAP example is a great example for where manufacturers, importers, and private labelers can do a little bit above and beyond to, to ensure a little bit more safety and have a higher degree of assurance that their products are safe and compliant. So on this subject, this is kind of a nice segue into our last topic about best practices for safety. How do I make the safest possible product? Well, you wanna practice safety by design. You wanna manufacture products and be thinking about the safety of the product, compliance requirements for the product at the design stage. Identify the potential risks consider foreseeable misuse of the product to try to eliminate or at least mitigate those risks and those hazards in your final version. It's really important and I highlighted and misuse a little bit in a different color because it's very important not just to think about foreseeable use of the product, but foreseeable misuse. If consumers misuse your product in a way that is dangerous, in a way that maybe is killing or severely injuring consumers, and if they're misusing the product in the same exact way, that could be a situation where there is a product defect, a pattern of defect, where the same scenario happens over and over that creates a dangerous scenario for consumers. And that is the type of discussion, that is the type of thought process that you wanna be having in the design stage, especially when we're talking about products for children, for babies, for other vulnerable populations. Very important to be thinking about this at an early stage. You wanna build safety into your supply chain. Don't assume that your supplier that your contract manufacturer, that your business partners overseas understand the requirements. They might be in your situation too. They might not know what they don't know. You can't assume that they know, even if they think that they know, even if they've told you that they know, they might not actually know the full picture. Maybe they understand that a toy standard exists and ASTM F963 is a uh, standard that children's toys sold in the US have to meet. But there are other things to consider beyond ASTM F963. There are other requirements, tracking label, certificate, lead and phthalates testing. Those are not us showing up in the toy standard, but they would still be required for the vast majority of children's toys. So one thing you can do is send them the robot, send them the regulatory robot. It's available in seven languages, including both traditional and simplified Chinese as well as Vietnamese, Indonesian, Korean, Spanish. This is available in lots of different languages. All of the requirements are available in, I would say most of those languages, some of them are not fully translated, but the Chinese, Spanish, Korean languages are fully translated. And so send them the robot, help them understand the requirements in their native language. Maybe that'll help them understand 
how to make a safe and compliant product for the US market. You might wanna also consider having outside firm do quality control or quality assessment audits during the production. If this is your first time working with a the supplier, they can promise the moon and they could give you golden samples that look and perform great during testing and then your actual products are less than that, are less safe, have lesser quality, have inconsistencies that could be dangerous or just hurt your brand too. I mean, so you know, there's, there's, there are considerations beyond pure safety, and I understand that, but I would make the argument that making safe products is good for business. Avoiding costly recalls, avoiding costly reproductions that can cost you valuable time. These are things to think about as well, even though my main concern here at the CPSC is the safety aspect. You want to be knowledgeable and aware of the regulatory environment. Review and closely monitor your consumer feedback. Monitor recalls. There's a lot of ways to do that. You can sign up with the CPSC Small Business Ombudsman to get our newsletter updates. Go to cpsc.gov forward slash email. And you can get those emails. We send them out monthly and it has all kinds of information from commissioner, commission activity, new rules and regulations coming into effect, new training opportunities, other highlights and important information. It's a great way to stay up to date. You can also go to federalregister.gov. That's federalregister.gov. Find the CPSC page that are organized by agency or any other agency you're interested in following, maybe the FDA, maybe the FTC, um, other agencies, all every federal agency is represented there. And you can sign up for alerts that will send to your email when new federal register notices are published. And federal register notices involve things such as new or proposed rules, commission activity, commission hearings, the types of vitally important information about what the commission is doing and its activity, how that affects, how that commission activity affects you and your product in your compliance and safety obligations. It's also important to understand your legal responsibility to report. And I alluded to this a little bit earlier, the cpsu.gov forward slash reporting will explain more in depth about when you might need to report. This applies to all consumer products under CPSC's jurisdiction. So all children's products and general use products broadly fall under this category and it's your obligation to report in certain scenarios such as when your product could create a substantial risk of injury or an unreasonably hazardous or dangerous situation these can be tricky to figure out cpsc.gov forward slash reporting and walk you through when it might be necessary for you to report information to the CPSC about a defect or a dangerous product. It's really important to be prepared to think about the worst case scenario. We don't really like to think about the worst case scenario, right? Who wants to think about that? But that's important because it can help you act quickly to minimize risk, to, to more efficiently recall a product that is potentially dangerous. And so there are some ISO standards here that could be helpful for you. I mean, you have to pay for them, these are not free. But even just the titles of these standards can give you some ideas for the types of things you wanna be doing. You wanna have a recall safety plan in place. You wanna have be thinking about reverse logistics if you need to conduct a recall. You wanna be thinking about how to manage your compliance from every step of the way, you wanna be thinking about producing the safest consumer product possible. One thing you can also do here is to use lot or batch controls, not just so children's products have to do this, the tracking label requirement. The general use products should, people that are making general use products should think about this too, because 
if there's a problem, if there's a defect, if there's even just a, a, a quality assurance or quality control issue, you can identify this more quickly and react more quickly to fix the problem. And you can minimize the affected number of products to narrowly focus on the product and the, the batch of products that have the problem, that have the issue. I can't say it enough. I try to tell everyone I talk to, to document everything you do. Document the work you do, document your efforts that you've put into trying to make safe and compliant consumer products. Write memos to yourself. I always encourage people to write memos to themselves about things that they have done, things that they are going to do, decisions that they have made. Sometimes you have to make a hard decision. There's a judgment call about how a product should be categorized, what the age range is, what the applicable audience is. It can be difficult and tricky to figure this out. I often encourage people to write a memo about that decision process. Why did you make the decision? What happened? What information did you look at when you were making this determination? Document that, save it in your file with your testing information, your CPCs or GCCs, all your compliance and safety related information in one place. And if there are any problems, you, you can demonstrate that you have shown a willingness to understand and try to do the right thing, to try to make safe and compliant consumer products. So document everything you can, save these things in a folder, and that can and hopefully avoid dangerous situations, risky situations, recalls, other things um, that you don't you don't want to be dealing with. And I'll just leave you here with the idea to challenge yourself to manufacture the safest possible consumer product. Again, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Safe products are good for business because if you're making a safe product, if you're making compliant and safe product. You're not dealing with injuries and deaths from your use of your product, as horrible as that would be for consumers that are going through that. From a business side, you're also not having to deal with that. There's really a benefit to thinking very seriously about making safe products. And one way you can do that you might wanna seek outside perspectives to assist you in appraising the safety of your product. You might want an objective party to give you an analysis of the safety of your product. This could be hiring some kind of human factors firm or analysis that can help identify potential pitfalls for you. Things that you can do, ways you can engineer out the safety hazards and make your product safer. But it's also just the safety culture of your company generally. If you're the head of your company or you're in a position of authority in your company, demonstrating to the rest of your employees that you are making safe products, that you value making safe products, that's important. That is what we're trying to do here. We're trying to not just make a compliant product, we're giving you the tools to understand how to make compliant products, but we're also giving you the tools to try to understand how to make a safe product or as safe a product as possible. It might be an unattainable goal to truly reach a 100% safe product, but it's the seeking out of that goal that's important, is striving to produce that safe product that's very important. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for joining. My name again is Will Cusey. I'm on the Small Business Ombudsman team here at the CPSC. This is my direct contact info. It's also our SBO email address and our SBO phone line. If you have questions and you think a phone call is better, please feel free to give us a call. If we don't answer, leave us a voicemail and we will return that call to you. You can find all of these webinars. We save all of them and record all of them for YouTube, our YouTube channel. And this is a clickable link. You can also just go to youtube.com forward slash USCPSC that lands you on our CPSC YouTube channel. Again, you can sign up for newsletter alerts from this 
CPSC Small Business Ombudsman. And here again is the link to the regulatory robot. It is business.cpsc.gov forward slash robot. Thank you again for joining. Please let us know at any time if you have additional questions. We are here to help.